everybody. Welcome to the Good Evening Kitties podcast, a Tales from the Crypt review. My name is Melissa, your ghostess with the mostest, and today's episode is Season 5, Episode 7, House of Horror. I have a special guest here again today with me. This is, his, I believe, third time being on the podcast. Joe Wren from the Discography Discussion Podcast. Hi, Joe. What's up, everybody? How's it going? Being confined to your basement... Well, it's basically normal for me when you think about it. <laughs> you have more than a basement. You have a pretty sweet basement, actually. So I do. It's, it's an bad. awesome studio that records many podcasts a week for discography discussion, discuss metal. And as soon as we all got comfortable, we all got isolated again. So yeah. welcome to the glory of technology. There's parts of it that's kind of interesting. I recently watched, because I love musicals and things, and it was Steven Sondheim's 90th birthday. That's awesome. So they put together like a presentation, but it was like two and a half hours of all these theater people doing everything from their homes, like singing and doing like all the stuff from like Zoom and things. And it actually was pretty good. I mean, it came out pretty good considering. Welcome to 2020, where the geeks rule. We've all been doing the remote communication, gaming, music production, video production thing for decades. And now the rest of the world is like, how do we do this? <laughs> yeah. It's our time now. So everything's good. Every, everyone's good. I hope everyone's good out there. It's still... Uh, Absolutely. It's going to be for a while, I think. Well, the good news is everybody who has to catch up on the Good Evening Kitties podcast can pop some popcorn, get a nice blanket, sit on the couch, pull up YouTube, and watch all of these episodes because they're there. I don't know how they're there, but they're there. Yeah, they're there. And I mean, also they can they can listen to different albums and then listen to the discography discussion about different ones, which I was just on one talking about Taproot. Absolutely. We kicked off New Metal May 2020 with Melissa, the current top downloaded episode of our podcast, Slipknot, featured you, and we brought you back again for New Metal May, led off with Taproot, so... We'll see if the trend continues. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know. It's Taproot. <laughs> Slipknot's got a little bit more of a, a pull, I think, than Taproot. But yeah, so you ready to talk about this pretty straightforward episode? I am so ready for Will Wheaton in his underwear. It's not even funny. <laughs> oh, gosh. Kevin Dillon is so bad in this. He's just so annoying. Okay. Season 5, Episode 7, House of Horror. I do not have the box still with me to have the info. It's somewhere in the apartment. I will find it. So for right now, I'll just go through IMDb. As always, John Kassir does the voice of the Crypt Keeper, and Danny Elfman does the theme song. This episode aired October 27th, 1993, and the summary for House of Horror is three pledges for a fraternity on probation run by a soft-spoken leader and his two sidekicks. Okay. Is our this visited... guy soft-spoken? <laughs> no. <laughs> are, visited, are visited by a beautiful young sorority gal who is looking for a frat to pledge her own sorority. I don't think that's right. Ends up tagging along with the pledges to an abandoned house where an urban legend murder took place years before. Basically, it's just some pledges trying to prove themselves in a fraternity. And so they have to go to this house and do certain things. And it's like an abandoned house and it's creepy and things happen and twists and turns and then it ends kind of crazy you can say crazy i would say beyond stereotypical there's the early and mid season tales from the crypt where yeah it was horror yeah it was comedy but it was still kind of complex and interesting this one reads start to finish like an episode of are you afraid of the dark yeah pretty much well I still kind of like the ending. It's it's kind of fun. I thought it was fun. Oh, don't get me wrong. I love the episode. And once again, congratulations. You asked me to come talk about an episode that I do remember fondly from the glory days of Fox. I think I just had a, I had a feeling. I was like, you know, I feel like Joe would have something to say about this episode. Oh, I have not that much to say, but I do enjoy it. I mean, you have fond memories of Tales from the Crypt when your first exposure to it was primetime TV, not HBO, as I've said before. So this one is on the list of episodes that stand out in my memory. And I'm not going to talk about the ending just yet, but no, let's it's not. kind of interesting to me how the plot line goes in that direction. So we'll get into that. Yes. Yeah, so this episode was directed by Bob Gale, who also directed the Back to the Future TV series. The screenplay was by Bob Gale. This has a pretty 
large cast. You know, you would know him from different other movies. A lot of them are from different other horror movies. So you got Keith Coogan from movies like Adventures in Babysitting, Michael DeLuise from movies like Encino Man. You got Courtney Gaines from movies like The Burbs, and he was also in Children of the Corn. Brian Krause was in TV's Charmed. Jason London was from movies like Dazed and Confused. Meredith Selinger was from movies like Village of the Damned. Will Wheaton from Stand By Me and Star Trek, right? Hell yes. Okay. The <laughs> next generation. I don't know if this was before, after, or during when it was filmed, but he wasn't quite the Will Wheaton that everybody looks on so fondly in 2020. Oh, he's such a little baby face in this one. Absolutely. So little. And Kevin Dillon, who overacts way, way too much. He's such in this a dick. Episode. <laughs> and he was also in movies such as Platoon. So we open up to the Crypt Keeper, and it's a court setting. And he has his big white wig on, and there's like a head on the stick, and tons of candles. And I see like a, I think like an American flag. But basically, we're on trial for this one, and we're on trial for watching too much Tales from the Crypt. <laughs> Great court is now in session. Will the defendant please approach the bench? You stand accused of watching too much tales from the crypt. Do you understand the charge? Neither do I. But I'll tell you this. If convicted, you'll receive a stiff sentence. You may even do a little horrid time. How do you bleed? All right, then. Let the trial begin. Yeah, so it's kind of fun. Like, he's opening up the big book to bring into the episode. And again, you know, we're all in trouble for watching too much Tales from the Crypt. Is there a thing as too much Tales from the Crypt? If this episode is bottom of the barrel, you could argue that stopping sooner than later was the better choice. But for me, there is no such thing as too much Tales from the Crypt. Even if this was the worst episode in the entire series, which it's not. It's definitely not. You'd have to watch it to appreciate the good episode so i'm being overly critical of it but overall i enjoy it yeah there's no such thing bring back tales from the crypt right now there's no such thing as too much i don't know about that i feel like they're gonna ruin it if they bring it back but we'll see it keeps getting pushed down so i don't know right it all depends on who takes it over there needs to be some sort of crypt keeper figure there's even some more episodes coming up in like season six that I, I enjoy and that I'm looking forward to doing. So, it, I mean, it's not as many big hitters as you would think, but this still has a rating of 7.5, I think, on IMDb, which I'm thinking it could be because it's part of the cast, probably. It's still a fun episode. It's just, it's just I want to smack Kevin Dillon across the face sometimes. He's such a dick. <laughs> so this episode opens up and it's in a fraternity. It's very cliche. You got like the wall of shame and like paddles that they're apparently like spanking everybody with. Some guys like out of it playing like on his Game Boy and there's beer and just guys just hanging around being dudes. And while they're all hanging around, there's three pledges that are there to work on getting into the fraternity, which always irritates me. So you do this to someone and then they get in the fraternity and then you're just supposed to be cool now? Like you're not mad at these people for what they made you do? It's supposed to be hazing. And in most cases, it's brotherhood aspect of we have to treat you like shit before we say you're cool. I've never been in a fraternity. I get the impression that it's not anywhere close to this bad well no and i would say most cases the stereotype of hazing probably comes from animal house and that was a fucking comedy true yeah <laughs> and well and nowadays like they definitely don't let you do this kind of stuff people would video record it and turn them in and it, it wouldn't be allowed and they've had tons of issues where people like drink too much and die and all this Absolutely. Is like, they've definitely changed things up so you just got to kind of take this with like a grain of salt and be like, oh, that's crazy. So Kevin Dillon shows up and he's kind of the head honcho, the pledge master. And the three guys who are pledging are uh, Waters, Henderson, and Arlene. And Arlene is played by Will Wheaton. And they're so nubile <laughs> and young and there's like no hair on their bodies. And they're basically here in these like tidy whities on their hands and knees scrubbing the floors with toothbrushes because that's what you do. Right, we went the ultimate stereotype here. You're going to clean the floor with a fucking toothbrush and crawl around on all fours. They get the point across really early that 
these guys really want to be here. Otherwise, why would you be putting up with this? Yeah. And they're walking around, um, like I said, on their ha- or they're going around on their hands and knees. and Definitely crawling. Crawling. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they are crawling. What I meant is Kevin Dillon comes walking in. And so he's dragging in dog crap on his shoes because that's what you do. You got to rub it in a little bit, right? So he's got this you know shit on his shoes and he comes in and he leaves it on the floor and he's like oh what's what's this you should clean this up hey arlie you turd ball didn't i tell you to clean this section of the floor over here yes sir grand and glorious pledge master wilton sir well is that dog shit i see on it yes it does appear to be canine fecal material sir and then he like sits down and puts his shoes up and he makes will wheaton kiss his foot i feel like that would be I'd be like, you know what? I'm good. I don't need, I'm good. Their tidy whities also say that they should, it says kick me on their butt. So I guess as you walk by, you can kick them should you feel so inclined. I don't get it. I, ne- I never got it when I was young. I didn't get it when I was in college and I don't get it today. I know it's supposed to be funny, but it's just annoying. Why would you go through this just to be part of a fraternity? Just to say you can put those three Greek letters on your jacket and all this other shit. It's not for me. Let's put it that way. I mean, a lot of fraternities aren't like this, but it, it's also, it's just like a whole power thing because even the three other guys in the fraternity that are sitting there really don't seem like they care. It's mostly Kevin Dillon, uh, who plays Les Wilton. And he's sitting there with his, the um, paddle, you know, and he's just kind of commanding them. And the other three guys are like, just paying attention to their own stuff. Like they're like, oh yeah, that's crazy. But they don't really... It doesn't seem like their hearts are really in it, you know, compared to Kevin Dillon, who's really just wanting to be powerful and things. And we find out later, too, that his character has been in the fraternity for like six or more years. He's not even close, I think, to graduating. He's just the older guy hanging around, living it up as long as he can. Right. It's basically Van Wilder mixed with the Kevin Bacon scene from Animal House. Yeah, I think eventually they'd be like, um, you're like 40. I don't think you can be here anymore. I mean, unless you became like an RA kind of thing or a, um, a, well, I mean, like for sororities, sometimes they would call like a house mother. So I'm not sure what they'd call it for fraternity. There's another thing too, is as um, Kevin Dillon's character is making Will Wheaton kiss his poo foot, he's telling a story about a previous pledge, I think from like the year before, so that had a nervous breakdown because of what they did to him. He couldn't handle it, so his picture's on the wall of shame. And they're all just laughing about it. Ha, ha, ha. You know, this guy had nervous breakdown. So that's something you kind of want to keep in the back of your head there. Another thing I noticed that I thought was fun is as... I think Kevin Dillon's character goes to get, like, a beer out of the fridge. And in the background in the kitchen are all these, like, beer kegs just stacked up. Because, you know, it's a party house. Right. You just got to have these beer kegs just out in the open. Nobody is monitoring these people, these these basically young, they're still kind of children. <laughs> right. So while that's happening, the three pledges are all sitting there and they're all like, one's got like kind of like a bowl cut and they got glasses and they're all kind of skinny and nerdy and they still have like their white socks on too. And they're talking about how they would love to just like beat the crap out of them and if they just hang on a little longer, they can get in here. And, but it's still like, why would you want to? I don't want to be friends with these guys. There's a knock at the door, and that's where we meet Mona, played by Meredith Solinger. Part of being a pledge is you have to answer the door. So Will Wheaton comes over on his hands and knees and opens the door, and it, we're met by a pair of legs, and then it goes up and you meet Mona. Why, y'all didn't have to get so dressed up just for little old me. Arlie, what's a pledge supposed to do in the presence of a lady? Oh, uh, welcome to Gamma Delta Omega. Pledge Arlie at your service, miss. Just call me Mona. My, you're quite a gentleman. And she seems sweet. Doesn't she seem nice? She's nice, but she's also playing that stereotypical 90s female college character. Yeah. She's in high heels. There's no reason for it. She's holding what appears to be a composition notebook and a trapper keeper. And she's here to recruit the fraternity to partner with the sorority for social events. Yes, because I think that's kind of a thing. I think usually there's like, at least I've seen that in other movies too, where like the one sorority will be partnered with a fraternity. Right, because the stereotype of the party in college is, or at least in the college towns, you want to have the guys and the girls. How do you get both in the same place when 
some of them don't want to mingle. Yeah. They're basically like, we need to find some guys that we would like to bang. Are you bangable? Or can you bring bangable people to our party? Yes. <laughs> Are there other bangable people here? Let us let us bang. So she's coming in, and this, the one guy, the president of the house or whatever, seems to be, I mean, they all seem like they're trying to be nice to her. And she immediately kind of acts like she's into Will Wheaton, even though he's on the floor. Like, she's already kind of flirting with him, like, oh, thank you so much for opening the door for me. Like, not at all weirded out or laughing at the fact that he's on his hands and knees in his underwear. It's almost like she expected to see something like this when she showed up. She probably did. She's probably like, this isn't that bad. I'll take it. Like, <laughs> I've seen some worse things. So she's coming in, and all the guys are like kind of flirting with her and stuff. And she says that she's from the sorority Delta Omega Alpha. And I was like, oh, DOA? Okay. That's Clever. okay. Is that something we need to hang on to for debt? Was that dead on arrival? Absolutely. So I was like, all right, DOA. Sure, sure. And so she comes in, and all the guys are talking to her. And she's explaining how she's looking, they're looking for a fraternity for the sorority. They want to have certain standards. And I think the guys are also like, well, you know, we'd like to meet some of the girls from the sorority. Again, let's see who's bangable, I suppose. <laughs> uh, it's 93. It really wasn't more complicated than that. And then Kevin Dillon's character shows up. And they're like, they're all, I mean, they're kind of being rude, but they're trying to. They're trying to be cool. Yeah. But he is so into his job of being the guy with the paddle that he's basically turning her down and hitting on her at the same time. Yeah. Melissa, I have a question. Does that work? Oh, no, no, no. He's gross. <laughs> yeah, no, I would. I I, uh, I was like, no, that's not going to work. Never. Because he's automatically. I mean, if anything, the president guy's got a better chance. The guy's standing next to him. Right. He's like, we'll talk about it. You know, we'll see what happens. But. Yeah. But yeah, Kevin Dillon's character is like, we could, and then like, I, you know, we could go to dinner or we could, you know, you can hang out with me or, you know, all this stuff. And so they're like, well, how about tonight? How about we get together? And the fraternity guys are like, well, this is like the big pledge night. We kind of have a thing we're going, we're doing right now, like a ritual that we have to go do. So they ended up inviting the girls come to this house that we're going to be doing the ritual and we can all meet up there. And so they're driving over to this house that's been there for, I think, like 60 years. Yeah, they start talking about the legend of the coughing ghost. End of the line, kiddies. Pledges walk from this point on. Waters, recite the history of the old coffer house. It was owned by an old, uh, an old hermit with a black cloak and hood who had this hacking cough. You could hear him a mile away. They called him the coffer, and his house, coffer house. Waters, swallow that gum. Have to say, continue. When the Alpha Sigma Sigma frat house burned down, the mayor, who had been a member, swindled the coffer out of his own house and gave it to the fraternity. The coffer then cursed the house and killed himself. Holy, wrap it up! A year later, nine members of Alpha Sigma who lived in the house, including the mayor's son, were murdered with an axe by someone wearing a black hood with a hacking cough. The house was condemned. That was 1933. Ever since then, people say the coffer's ghost is still in there, making sure nobody's in his house. They say you can still hear him coughing. Essentially, it's a haunted house situation. Nothing fancy. It doesn't have to be fancy. He tells him you've got to go upstairs, shine your light out the first floor, or the second floor, and then do the same thing from the attic. And whatever you do, don't come down until we come get you. And they have to go one by one. And so they get there, and the girls show up. And it's, it's Mona, and then she brought, like, three other girls. And these other girls, you don't think much of it, but they are often quiet. And they're just, like, sitting there, like, they're kind of bored, like, okay, what, let's hurry up and do this. It's cold, you know, <laughs> hanging out there, like, whatever. So you don't really talk too much with them. It's mostly Mona talking for them. She shows up in a letterman jacket. Even in 93, if the girl shows up in a letterman jacket, it's because she's wearing her boyfriend's jacket. Yeah, I was wondering so that too. it kind of makes her look like shit, but then it makes the other guys look like shit or makes him look like an asshole. Well, see, I wondered about that because I was like, first of all, or at least where did she get this jacket? Even if she didn't have a boyfriend, usually, yeah, that, that was right. the case. But I mean, they do, I mean, they got to have jackets like that for girls too, right? Oh, they do. It's just that was one of the stereotypes of the 90s high school movies. Hers doesn't fit her too big, so I mean, it could be hers. But yeah, it is a little bigger on her, so I don't know. I mean, it really depends. I When I was in high school, I had a guy, a couple of guy friends that had them, and they're very comfy. So I would just like <laughs> steal it from them and just wear it because it was usually really big and you just like wrap it around yourself. 
and they're like real heavy it's like wearing a giant cape yeah they're just really heavy <laughs> but it's like we weren't dating it was just like oh my gosh it's cold can i have your jacket and he was like okay so and i'm sure the person who wrote this would say you're focusing on the wrong plot point we had to make them look like college kids and the best thing we could come up with was jackets we found at goodwill well i don't know see we'll get to another theory i have on it but not not yet so they've set up different special effects and things in the house to scare them, obviously. There's like a coughing sound and I think like a chainsaw. So Mona, where's the rest of your sisters? That can't be all of them. I don't know if they'll all make it. Too bad. Me and Sparks here rigged up some great gags. They're gonna miss a good show. at the hospital lung cancer ward then pumped them up on the synthesizer but what i love is the guy who's doing the special effects is in the car he's sitting in like a convertible and his remote is huge you ever played like on nintendo they had that really big pad that was like a controller it looks like a like they really just like added a bunch of things together to make this giant remote i would compare it to something that Steve Urkel put together yeah. <laughs> or something that you saw in the Hackers movies from the 80s. Don't get me wrong, it's awesome to look at it because it's a bunch of radios triggering wirelessly. That's really cool. Yes. My only question is, if they're sending them in one at a time and he's just sitting out on the convertible, don't the pledges that haven't gone in yet kind of get the point? That's true. Yeah, that's true. So then by then you get to the second and third one, they're like, well, I can see the guys doing it. So I'm just going to go in there and go like it would kind of defeat the purpose. I'm not sure why they didn't send them all in by themselves, really. Or I mean, together. Or at least keep them blindfolded. Yeah. We're probably focusing on the wrong plot point again. Well, I don't know, because they did have them blindfolded <laughs> on the way there. And then when they get there, they're like, nah, and they just like take the blindfolds off. I also don't understand why this house has been here for like 60 years. It's not even like boarded up, really. It's just sitting there. So... I don't know about you, but if I was going to have to go into a house like this and do this sort of thing, I'm not wasting my time. I always hate when they walk into one of these houses and they're scared immediately and they just stand there and slowly walk up the stairs. I'm like, just run. Run up the, <laughs> run up the stairs. Just do it fast, right? Get up there. I mean, the only problem is at one point when he's, I believe Jason London's character goes first, he goes and there's a dummy that drops down from between, between the staircase there that when he's walking on the staircase. So, I mean, if you were running, I guess that would hit you pretty hard. <laughs> right. But, I mean, it was cool. Jason London's character, Henderson, sees the dummy come down. He realizes it's a dummy. So, by then, I would definitely be like, it's all set up stuff. There's nothing to worry about. Just hurry up and get up to the stupid floor and do this. Right. So, I mean, it wouldn't really worry me that much by then. I mean, I still don't like it. I don't like haunted houses. <laughs> so I love horror movies, but I'm a huge wimp when it comes to all this stuff. <laughs> so, you're the target for this type of initiation. Oh, my gosh. Oh, I, I wouldn't even do it. I'd be like, you guys are on your own. I'm doing this. Yeah, so what they're figuring out, too, the guys who are in the fraternity are noticing that some of the sounds are coming on without him hitting the button on the remote. So they're like, I thought that was supposed to be a chainsaw sound. And the guy's like, it was. I don't know what happened. I don't know. I guess it's acting up. So Henderson, Jason London's character, makes it to the second floor, and he flashes the light. And so they're like, cool, he made it. Now he's just got to work his way up to the attic. Will Wheaton's character sees a guy in like a cloak or something walking through the window. There's somebody on the second floor with a cloak and an axe. Are you shitting me, Arling? No, man, I swear to God, I just saw him. And he's like, guys, did you guys see that? Oh my gosh. And so, of course, they're calling him a chicken. They're like, you just don't want to go in there. He's like, no, seriously, there's someone walking around. Right, he goes into Wesley Crusher mode once he's off the floor and just starts calling out shots like there's somebody on the second floor with a cloak. Yeah, and so that's when uh, I believe Keith Coogan's character, Waters, is like, you know what, I'm going to go in there. I'm just going to run in there. So he runs in, and he starts checking it out. He heads up floor here, and he finds some blood on the railing of the staircase. 
And then he realizes it's like strawberry jelly. He licks it, which I'm like, okay. I mean, I guess you could smell it. You're probably like, hmm, strawberries. Right. Plus, if it's cold, it's not going to be red, you know. True. It's clearly a haunted house situation. Yeah. And at this point, if you've never seen the episode, you're going to buy it for that. Like, okay, what's the twist? It's not obvious, but I feel like it is. When you go back and you think about little things, you're like, yeah, I guess. I guess I could see that. It's more about... I mean, I'm more excited about what happens to Kevin Dillon. Uh, right. So, during this... That's basically the point, right? Yeah. Kevin Dillon's a douche, <laughs> and he's going to get his payback. And so, during this, <laughs> Will Wheaton's looking around at Mona, and she's, like, winking and, like, hey, you know, and I was like, I thought it was kind of cute. I was like, okay, it's kind of sweet. Like, she seems like a nice person for the most part, and that she's not super swayed by the jerks in the fraternity, which was nice. So, they're still having trouble with the sound and things. The sound guy's trying to figure it out. And during this the second window breaks and an arm comes flying out of the window it's waters who throws it out because i guess he found it and throws it out the window starts screaming at the guys about how sick they are there's a comment made about medical school or medical class and how did they get this was he screaming from the okay yeah he is screaming from the window yeah yep he basically found it on the floor up until this point you've heard chainsaw sounds that every time the sound guy gets asked about it he mentions that it's not him well and then they go to touch the arm on the because it fell on the hood of the car and they go to touch it and they're like whoa it's warm or like it's real you know like yeah that's when you're saying they, they must have got it from like the medical department or whatever which that's real rude if you do I, I don't know how you sneak one of those out you're like guys we gotta steal a human arm these guys don't seem like they could steal anything successfully they make a bet on mona yeah, they make a bet on who's going to get Mona. Which is funny, because she kind of eggs it on, but it seems like she's clearly made her decision, and she's just screwing with the other guy. But then, you know, she's trying to build up Will Wheaton's character, like, 100 bucks to buy us a real good dinner date. Yeah. They do this shot of the hose again, like, come on. It's... You mean her uh, legs? I, yeah. Yeah, they do do I'm, a lot. I'm sorry, I should a, have said hosiery. Yeah, they do a lot of, like, <laughs> shots of just, like, her leggings and just, like, her feet and just, like, yeah, she's a woman, like, kind of thing. Uh, you ever had one of these before, Wesley? I know you haven't. <laughs> I guess that's his character from Star Trek. Yes. Yes, I don't watch a lot of Star Trek. Uh, we'll talk later. It's fine. I'm not, I'm, I'm probably not missing anything. Yes, yeah, so that's a $100 bet if he goes in there and isn't a chicken, then we'll wait to get the $100. Which I'm kind of surprised they even did, that they weren't just like, get your ass in there. But Kevin Dillon really wants to see this play out. It's that split second in the Pledge Master's job where he's losing somebody. True. Because it comes back on him if people quit also. So now he just shifted into motivator. Like, I got a hundred bucks that says you won't go in there. But he's also trying to pledge new brothers. Yeah. You got to have people join. Right. But he's also, like, kind of getting told what's what, and he doesn't like being put on the spot in front of everyone. Because even the guys in the fraternity are like, this is getting kind of stupid. We don't have to be this harsh kind of thing. Right. So, Will Wheaton's character goes in there, and he's looking for Waters and Henderson. He gets up to the second floor. Yeah, so he starts screaming. So then everyone comes running in. So now everyone's in there. Yeah, because he falls down the stairs. Yeah, there was a cloaked figure walking around. He gets a shot of his face, and it's just that ugly deteriorated halloween mask thing yeah it's just this dummy and so so everyone's in the house now and it's a cool house i mean it's cool how they have it set up it's like all these boards of wood with like lights coming through it's i guess it's supposed to be boarded up but the door opens fine so i don't know of course they could have just took the stuff off the door and been like whatever and will wheaton saying it's not a dummy as a ghost i saw it and so they're like trying to get kevin dylan to go up there and check it out and he's scared and so they're doing the whole like fuck 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 chicken all that stuff because you know, that works. That's not annoying at all. <laughs> <laughs> and so now they're still hearing, like, the sounds and stuff as he's heading up. And Kevin Dillon is, is scared. And he's like, someone come with me or whatever. And they're like, what? You know, you know what's up? Just go. And the sound guy's like, that's not me. I turned everything off. Right. It turned from making fun of Will Wheaton, calling down the two guys that did go up there, into, why don't you go up there and get him? Yeah. The show just keeps going back and forth between who's being put on point, and he's clearly scared shitless and doesn't want to go. He's not into his own thing. He gets up to the second floor. He gets up to the second floor, and from behind him is a cloaked figure with, I believe, an axe, right? Yeah, absolutely. An axe and a mask, and it's a cloaked figure that comes out and scares the crap out of him, and he falls down. <laughs> <laughs> Your 
remember me? D.D. DeWitt. The wall of shame. I guess I proved that you're not Gallic Delta material either. <laughs> and about those other pledges, I put a note on the attic door telling them not to signal or do anything until they heard the password, happy birthday. And I signed the note, Les Wilton. <laughs> Nobody does that to me! It's that pledge from the year before that was on the wall of shame. Calling bullshit. He's got his glasses on under the mask. That doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It, unless he had them like in a pocket and took it off real quick or something. But I don't think so. But yeah, so he's there. And so what he's saying, this guy that they'd been teasing, is that he left a sign up on the second floor to let the other guys know. So I put a sign on the door that says, don't come down unless you hear the phrase, happy, happy birthday. birthday. Which, sure. So, you hear the phrase, happy birthday, that means it's safe, you can come down. So that's why the guys were under the impression that Waters and Henderson are hiding somewhere and waiting to hear this. So now the girls are bored. Mona and the girls are like, you know what, this is stupid. This, Yeah, this is stupid. So they go to leave and <laughs> Kevin Dillon's like, no, Mona, wait, no. And then even the guys in the fraternity are like, you know what, this is, no one cares anymore. Why are we doing this? But yeah, I do like how everyone was like laughing when that guy showed his face, the guy that they tease, because he did get them pretty good. Oh, he did. Even the guys in the fraternity kind of have respect for him. They're like, yeah, that was pretty good, man. That You got us pretty good. It's fine. You know, no hard feelings. It was mostly Kevin Dillon's character that this guy was mad at anyway, it seems like. Right. And of course, this is the part of the episode where the arm from earlier comes back to haunt them. Yes. Somebody's apparently been carrying this thing around for Courtney, the past five Courtney minutes. Courtney Gaines' character is just carrying it like, hey, y'all see this arm? Even though they guess it's from a cadaver and he's still carrying it around. Like, you guys see this arm? It's still kind of warm, <laughs> I think. I don't know. Maybe someone sat and on they it. They look at the class yes, ring. Yes, they see that there's a pledge ring on it. And, oh my gosh, it's Henderson's arm. They're freaking out about that. And while they're doing that, Kevin Dillion's character is heading up to the second floor. And he sees the note that has like a... Of course, it has like a, a dart on it holding it to the door. So he heads upstairs and he, he's mad. He takes the sign off the door and he's looking for Waters and Henderson. He's like, come on, guys. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Let's hurry up and get out of here so we can go. So he gets up to the attic. There's like you know, a bunch of old furniture and like sheets on everything. And it's dusty. And there sure is a lot of light coming into the house from all directions. You think because they left some of their car lights on. But it almost seems like they set up floodlights everywhere. And so he's looking around and he comes over and he finds this trash can and it's just full of body parts, like skulls, and all the meat has been like picked off of everything. It's just a big old bucket of meat. Big old bucket of meat bones. <laughs> and that's when Mona and the three other girls come out. Some other girls are with them too now. And they come out and he's like, what's going on? And she's like, welcome to Delta Omega Alpha Pledge Night. <laughs> we just love fraternity boys. You see... DOA is an all ghoul sorority. <laughs> You're about to become Delta Omega material now. Dinner. See, Les? You get your dinner date after all. And I'm just so famished for a man. Remember pledges. Each, every bite, or you'll end up on the wall of shame. <laughs> so it's their pledge night as well. Oh, shit. They come forward and their faces are all messed up. And they're like, we love fraternity boys. So do you remember in the 90s when there was a show called Buffy the Vampire Slayer? <laughs> And a yeah, few movies like that. <laughs> that shall remain unnamed at this point. But the stereotypical vampire ghoul face yes. alterations, the makeup and the appliances. Well, and like the eyebrows are kind of pushed down a little bit to give them like that little like evil thing. And then their noses are a little more pointed. And yeah, they're, they're ghouls. So the DOA sorority, the dead on arrival, <laughs> Delta Omega Alpha sorority are ghouls and they want to eat them and so there's a that more girls come up there's apparently is there like a elevator yeah it looks like there's like an elevator they're ghouls i just assumed they climbed up the wall and crawled in through one of the windows 
Yeah, well, Mona comes up on an elevator and she's got like this blue dress on or something and she takes off her letterman's jacket. And that's where I was wondering too, because even though it's a little, it's a little bigger than her. So what I was thinking is maybe that's just a letterman's jacket that from another guy she killed. Oh, it has to be. Yeah. So it's not even like a, that's, that's just like a, it's like a trophy for her. Like she's like, yes, this is a nice coat. Right. And the leader has got the real lacy thing on. The rest of the girls are wearing some form of leather, except for the couple girls that came with Mona. Yeah, they just got dresses on. One of them has appeared with a chainsaw. Yes, one has a chainsaw, one has a meat cleaver. <laughs> they're like very 90s with like chokers and things on. And they're like, yes, you have to eat every bite or you'll end up on the wall of shame. And they've got wall of shame and even a paddle nailed up that says Delta Omega Alpha on it. <laughs> So, like, this is their sorority house. I so guess. the whole spin here was when Mona came to invite the fraternity brothers to social gatherings, they were inviting them to this place so that they could eat them. Definitely. That's the twist. And what's funny is because you still kind of, like, at first you're like, so was there, like, a chainsaw killer? And it's like, no, it was one of the girls. That's who was just running around up there somehow avoiding this other guy who had the nervous breakdown as well. Like, they were very sneaky. Right. The legend was that the coughing killer murdered people with an axe, but there was a chainsaw noise the whole time. So you're not supposed to notice these things when you watch Tales from the Crypt, but this is not one of the better episodes as far as the plot. It's kind of readable at the very beginning. The twist is kind of fun, though. The twist is fun. It's basically vampires and they say ghouls because i can't think of a lot of horror movies that featured ghouls in this role they do it in a previous episode too when i did um the episode morning mess uh, and it was like where these group of what they were called ghouls the abbreviation they had was actually spelling out the word ghouls and it was like they were killing homeless people because no one would remember them or like worry about them But they looked a little different. They looked a little more like vampires. Like they pulled their hair off and had like just like little pointy ears and things. Right. Seems similar to that for me. I mean, I kind of like the twist. Do you think everyone else got out of there or do you think the girls killed them? I think the ending would be that if they didn't just kill them outright, they probably chased them all down before they got out of there. The last scene, of course, is... Kevin Dillon's head rolling down the stairs because he's been decapitated. And what did she say? If you don't eat every bite, you end up on the wall of shame. So somebody's coming down those stairs yeah. looking for that head. Yeah, so the head comes down the stairs. And it's not it's done fairly well. But I guess it was in the attic too, right? So did they really like come down and drop it pretty far? Like, Or was that the second floor? It was the attic, so that would have had to be a taunt. I know, they had to like come down. In the, yeah. Someone came down from the attic threw the head down the stairs like it could have gone on further but how does it end it ends in death the head looks pretty close to kevin dylan i think but um yeah so then they all scream and then it ends that's the end of the episode so yeah part of me is like i feel like some of them probably got out but then part of me was also like i kind of hope they just killed kevin dylan too anyway noticeable detail that this was the twist is mona she plays the role of the siren character really really well or the vampire that has the ability to attract unsuspecting people to their lair and since she's not the leader she's a new pledge this was probably her job you've got to go out and get us some fraternity boys oh my gosh i didn't think about that she was the pledge exactly i was thinking she was the leader but that makes more sense yep oh that's cool yeah i kind of like that it's really cool there was two pledge rituals going on at the same time. They just happen to be going at the same place. All right. Yeah. Yeah. See, I think it's still fun. It's a bit of a build up for it, but it's and a little bit of overacting, but it's it's still kind of fun. I like the ending. But yeah, so that's the end of that episode. Uh, and then it cuts back to the Crypt Keeper, and we're still at the Honorable Judge Crypt Keeper in trial for watching too much Tales from the Crypt. And he's just spouting puns and having a good time. <laughs> Crypt Keeper, you're so punny. And the best Crypt Keeper pun is... I know they say that college costs an arm and a leg, but this is ridiculous. (laughs) 
There is no IMDb trivia for this episode for Season 5, Episode 7, House of Horror. The next episode is Season 5, Episode 8, Well-Cooked Hams. Joe, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me, as always. Do you want to tell everyone a little bit about Discography Discussion? For anyone that does not know, Discography Discussion is a heavy metal podcast where myself and co-host Dan Terry and whoever else wants to show up, talk about a band's discography. We just launched New Metal May 2020, so you can hear Taproot and Coal Chambers coming up. You can look at our entire back catalog. There's over 168 episodes of metal bands that we have listened to, their entire discography, and talked about. Melissa's been featured on more than one episode, so come check it out. And we actually have a new show called Discuss Metal, where the wonderful co-host of mine, Discuss Metal Dan, is sitting down and having in-depth conversations with artists and podcasters and in a few instances youtube stars so it's a little less talk about one band and a little more talk about the people so you should come check it out everything's at discussmetal.com oh yeah so everyone thank you so much for supporting the podcast and for downloading subscribing listening everything you can find the good evening kitties podcast pretty much wherever podcasts are found there is a facebook page you can follow as well as a twitter page that's at gek podcast or at gek podcast you can also leave a review on itunes podcast republic or facebook again thank you so much for listening everybody stay safe out there and have a good one joe say bye bye everybody I just had quite a scare. I actually thought my heart was beating again.